Support for St. Louis Public Radio comes from The Rep, kicking off its new season with Dial M for Murder. High suspense unravels on The Rep stage as a murder plot spirals into chaos. Dial M for Murder opens September 18th. Tickets at repstl.org. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. State Representative Barbara Pfeiffer decided not to run for another term in the Missouri House. Instead, the Kirkwood Democrat is running for Secretary of State. And on the latest episode of Politically Speaking, she explains why the contest against Republican Denny Hoskins is one of the most important statewide matchups on the November 5th ballot. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. My promise to St. Louis was that I would do the absolute most for each and every person, starting with those who have the very least. What I wanted to do was look and see what other states are doing. We have to be willing to change those laws that they are balanced and they affect everybody equal. As somebody that grew up in the St. Louis area, North St. Louis County, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. We gotta find long-term solutions to make government better, but also to be able to provide services to people. I don't wanna leave that federal money that we've been leaving all these years on the table. We need to be spending this money to take care of Missourians. I thought we accomplished a lot this year, but a lot more needs to be done. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. We have a full house here in St. Louis because our state government and state politics reporter is in the building, and she is... Sarah Kellogg. And also in the building, she's the Democratic nominee for Secretary of State. Barbara Pfeiffer. Welcome back to the show. Your third time on the program, but your first as a statewide nominee. Um, You could have run for the House again, but you decided to escape that uh, lower chamber of the General Assembly. Why did you decide to run for Secretary of State instead of another term in the House? Well, they're two separate questions. I had decided to retire, actually. And I did that, oh, yeah, a year and a half ago. I I thought that it was time for me to quit being in the House, and I recruited a person to run as a Democratic nominee. Mark Boyko, Mark by the Boyko. way, who was actually was on Politically Speaking in 2016 when he ran for the state Senate. Well, he, he's wonderful, a, a good friend, and he's on the uh, school board in Kirkwood. And uh, so anyway, uh, we made that decision. But even at that point, I was very concerned about the Secretary of State race. In, in my looking out at the state, this is the single most important statewide race in Missouri this year. And I could see that a year and a half ago. And so I, I told my husband, even as I was planning to retire, honey, you just need to know that if we don't have somebody on the Democratic side with experience who's running for Secretary of State, I'm going to do that. And I went, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> but uh, last summer, I, I talked to some people in the Missouri Party and Democratic Party and said, Hold me in the, uh, your back pocket. I will run and I will serve if I'm elected. Uh, if we need a Democratic nominee, and looking at the people who were stepping forward and not stepping forward uh, in early winter, I would went ahead and decided to run because we need a strong candidate for Secretary of State. And so here I am. You ended up winning your primary by a relatively small margin compared to other statewide Democratic candidates, but the Republican primary was just, there was a lot there (laughs) with eight candidates running to secede Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft. What was it like to witness kind of that unprecedented crowded primary? Well, it was fascinating on one hand. Uh, There were lots of different choices. Uh, It, to me, is maybe a micro cosm of the macrocosm of the disarray and chaos within the Republican Party in Missouri. Uh, and I'm just an observer of that. I, you know, Obviously, I'm not part of that, except that we experienced the fallout in our legislature. So um, here we are. We'll talk more about GOP nominee for Secretary of State Denny Hoskins' policy positions throughout the show. But I want to talk about the politics of this race. You're running against someone who has made enemies with several 
powerful and well-funded groups. So I'm talking about casinos and Missouri sports teams. They're very mad that he blocked uh, sports betting for many years. Um, I know this is kind of like a crass question, but I think it's like a, there's an accountability question here. Are you expecting those groups to maybe support you out of spite? And should they? And if they don't, is that just a sign that people can do whatever they want with no political consequences? Well, that's an interesting question because you have to remember I am a retired United Methodist pastor. So coincidentally, Denny Hoskins and I probably have very similar views on those two issues. <laughs> Maybe the only two things that we agree on, except that we love Missouri. Uh, so uh, there have been absolutely nobody from casinos nor sports betting who have been knocking on my doors, nor do they, I expect them to. Why do you think you're a candidate who can bring together the urban, suburban, and rural coalition the Democrats need to piece together in order to win? Well, again, uh, who I am. Uh, as a former United Methodist pastor, I have served churches all over the state of Missouri. I've been the pastor to people in open air country churches. I've lived in a town of uh, 200. I've lived in a town of 112. I've lived in southeast Missouri, northwest Missouri, uh, northeast Missouri, as well as St. Louis. I'm from Columbia. So I, I have a breadth of experience of people who live in Missouri and the different ways of life. I also am bilingual. I speak Spanish fluently. I was uh, chair of a board of a bilingual uh, medical clinic in St. Louis for a number of years. I, my husband was uh, the CEO of what's called, what used to be called Kingdom House and is now LifeWise. Uh, lots of experience in inner city St. Louis. So I, I have a breadth of life experience that a lot of people just don't have. Let's shift to the Secretary of State's office, which includes monitoring securities, registering businesses, and overseeing elections. Why do you feel that you are qualified to do this job? I think experience in the state legislature is extremely helpful to understand uh, the legislative process and how laws are made and implemented. And certainly there are very good professional people within the office of the Secretary of State that oversee specific functions of the Secretary of State. There are seven different functions, and the Secretary of State is not expected to have uh, areas expertise in all seven of those functions. So uh, administrative skills, competence, professionalism, honesty, uh, willing to be transparent, uh, leadership at the top really sets the tone for any kind of administration, and I think I would be excellent at that. You know, the the marquee issue kind of of the Secretary of State's office is elections, and we will talk about elections later, but this office has other duties, like I said, like business registration. What would you want to do differently on this front if you're Secretary of State? Well, the one thing I hear over and over again is information on the website. And I think perhaps some of the bad news on that is the state is trying to implement a whole new website for all of the administrative offices. So it's a it's a very complicated process. But the one thing I can pro promise, again, is honesty about that. I There's no way that the Secretary of State can wave a magic wand and those issues are going to be immediately resolved. What I can say is I will make it a top priority to make sure that we keep pushing forward on this issue. Um, you know, two years ago, and the, the, we were told that it was going to be up and running and completely implemented in like eight months, and it still hasn't been. Something else that's not often talked about is securities regulation. What would you do in that space that's different from prior Secretary of State holders? I don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert on securities. I'm sure you're not either. But it seems like maybe you would be responsible for hiring the people that would run that office. Is there any like programmatic ideas that you may have about how to best protect Missouri securities? Well, securities also have federal implications too. Mm -hmm. So Missouri doesn't stand alone in that. The one thing I can guarantee is immediately uh, get together with people who are experts in this field and say, what do we need to do better? And I think that that's always a question to ask because we 
are state servants. And to serve the people, we have to know what the needs are. So uh, that would be how I would begin. One of the recent controversies that uh, Secretary of State Ashcroft encountered was blocking a slate of emergency rules from <clears throat> Governor Mike Parson aimed at restricting hemp-derived THC products. First of all, what do you make of Ashcroft's decision here? And what would kind of be your approach to dealing with emergency rules that are put forth by either future Governor Kehoe or future Governor Quaid? Because that is part of the Secretary of State's office. Well, uh, all I know about it is what I read in the newspaper. And it was bewildering to me. Uh, the governor's letter indicated that Ashcroft gave no reasons for doing this, except to say he just didn't feel like, and I think the word was feel, like it was appropriate. <sighs> How a Secretary of State feels about something is is not a, a leading indicator of what should be done. Yeah. I think what Secretary Ashcroft said, and I talked with him about this, is he didn't believe it was an emergency to restrict these products from businesses with liquor stores. And sort of the 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 hypothetical I produced is, you know, the governor is saying that kids are taking these uh, products mm -hmm. and ingesting them and going to the hospital. Well, you could also ingest a bunch of marijuana-infused gummies and go to the hospital, too, but these aren't being regulated the same way as these hemp-based products because the marijuana-based products are constitutionally protected. But it doesn't change the fact that, like, the danger still exists. And if that danger still exists, you can't prove it's an emergency. Sorry, that is a long-winded observation and not a question, but it seems like that is a logical explanation on why this may not reach the threshold of emergency. Yeah, emergencies can be thought about uh, in terms of regulations. They can also be thought about in terms of what affects people. So, you know, I think I tend to agree with Governor Parson on this one because if it ultimately is not as important whether or not regulatory, reg, oh, regulatorily, they are exactly the same. But if we know that children are being harmed, that is an emergency. And so there would be a reason to take action. An unlikely area where the Secretary of State has received more attention as of late is libraries. It should be noted that the Secretary of State does not run or control libraries, but they can provide state funding for them. Secretary Ashcroft talked on this program a while ago about rules around placement of what he deemed to be inappropriate material around children. What do you think of that idea, and how would you have handled it differently? To me, it's a non-issue. I firmly believe that local libraries should have local control of the local space. Communities know what they need, and library boards come from the local com community. I also am absolutely convinced that the Secretary of State can't know what children should be reading or not reading. That's something that their parents know, or their grandparents, or whomever they're living with. How do you balance a library's overall goals about being a place where people can learn about ideas and concepts in which they may not agree with, with shielding kids from things which are unquestionably not appropriate for them? Again, I think that's something that libraries do very well, and I simply leave that to libraries to figure out. Yeah, there, uh, one of the Republican candidates for Secretary of State who did not win, <laughs> Senator Mary Elizabeth Coleman, put out the idea that, like, library boards should be elected everywhere as opposed to appointed. I believe the St. Louis County Library Board is appointed by, like, the county executive and I think similarly in cities. What, what do you think about that idea? Um, I think it has pluses and minuses, but it is certainly an idea that is interesting enough for me to use as a question on a podcast. So there you go. Yeah, I don't think there's an overwhelming need to do that. Uh, there are elections behind library board members, which are city councils or county councils, uh, mayors, county executives. And uh, elections matter, certainly. But we do know that sometimes those kinds of elections can become super contentious and end up destroying communities. So 
I think the system we have ha- have has worked for years and years and years. And that old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We'll be right back after this quick break with Democratic Secretary of State nominee Barbara Pfeiffer. And we're back on Politically Speaking with Barbara Pfeiffer. She is the Democratic nominee for Secretary of State. Now we're going to get into elections, which I think is probably the most common link with the Secretary of State's office among normal people. Um, Although normal people might think Secretary of State of Missouri, like, goes to other countries and does peace treaties, but that's for another day. Uh, One of the prime roles of being Secretary of State is to coordinate with counties' local election officials. What would be your posture forging those relationships, especially if those officials have much different visions on how elections should be run. To begin with, uh, there has been a huge turnover in election officials in Missouri. Uh, We have had about 25% turnover since 2000, maybe even 2002. And I have been told that in November this year of 24, quarter of our election officials will be new. This is uh, their first big election. So certainly helping people to learn their jobs, to do them well, to give encouragement to our election f- officials, uh, to communicate regularly with them, in, not simply in coming from the Secretary of State's office, but back and forth if people have questions. Uh, a lot of people feel very alone and isolated, feel uh, as if they are under attack. And I believe that the Secretary of State's office can do a lot to help people feel supported, let them know that they're not alone, develop a sense of community. And that's really important to me. That would be the first step. You will be facing off against State Senator Denny Hoskins in the general election. One of the main things he's been running on is hand counting ballots instead of using machines. And we have a clip of him talking uh, earlier um, with actually Jason at the Missouri State Fair in Sedalia. Explain how you're going to make local officials do hand counting. Well, first of all, I can't make the local officials do anything. And so that's why, like, Senator Igel and I both filed bills in order to mandate hand counting ballots. But what I promised the county clerks is I know a lot of them are nervous and a lot of them are scared about hand counting ballots. I will have said that, hey, it's already in Missouri state statute, the process and procedures on to hand count ballots. And I will provide all the education and training for any county clerk that wants to hand count ballots. So you're not going to require them. The Secretary of State cannot require the county clerks to hand count ballots. That is correct. What do you think about Hoskins' stance here? Well, I think he's correct. I also think it's a bit disingenuous. Uh, there is a, a well, I guess a bully pul- pulpit whenever somebody has a statewide job. And he's quite correct. He cannot mandate that. I cannot mandate that. But he can also advocate for changing the law. And he has done that in the past. I suspect that that would be what he wants to do in the future as well. I was speaking with uh, one of the eight candidates uh, on the Republican side before the primary, and he told me that in Greene County alone, in November, if they had to do hand counting of the ballots, that would be five million different things that they would have to hand count. That's extraordinary. Extrapolate that out to the state of Missouri. It, it, to me, is a recipe for chaos. And certainly Osage County, which has tried that, it's continued to be chaos and it's continuing to disrupt people. So, you know, ultimately, I think just from a, a very pragmatic point of view, one has to look at the pros and the cons. And Statistically, uh, do machines do a better job of tabulating than people by hand? It, all the evidence that I have seen would say that machines are far better at doing that. Uh, statistically, how quickly is an election determined between machine tabulation and hand counting? All the evidence I have seen would say that machine counting is far more rapid. Uh, statistically, uh, as we look around the country, what kind of discord does develops after an election between machine counting or hand tabulation? And we've seen just a lot more discord with the hand counting. So I see absolutely no advantages to hand counting. 
I do think that Hoskins is tapping into a very real skepticism about the outcome of elections, especially among Republicans. How are you going to convince people in the state that vote counting machines are accurate and like what you just said is the truth and not like what critics of vote counting machines say? I don't think I can convince anybody of anything they don't want to be convinced of. So there's a group of people who you can say the sun comes up from the east to the west as much as you want, and if they want to believe it starts at the west and goes east, they're going to. So we just put the information out there and know that some people are willing to listen and other people are not. On the other hand, there is a large group of people who may be skeptical but are very open to actually hearing information. And so it's always the job of the Secretary of State to let people know early and often what voting is all about in Missouri, what we're doing. That has to do with the transparency element of the job. Uh, one thing that I would invite people to do is uh, go on a tour. Call your election officials and say, hey, we'd like to go and see what happens and, and how voting occurs in Missouri. One of the things that I find fascinating is that there's not a single machine that is attached to the internet in the state of Missouri. I think that's great. It's, uh, I took a tour of the St. Louis County Election Office, and it is astonishing what they do there. One of the things in Missouri is certification occurs with both Republicans and Democrats involved. We have a lot of safeguards in the Missouri system. It's considered one of the safest in the country. And I really think it's irresponsible to uh, foment that kind of doubt about our democracy when there is absolutely no evidence to back it up. And it's dangerous at this point in our our civil life. So uh, finally, this is a Republican state. It, it's curious to me that there are Republicans who doubt the election results of Republican candidates in a Republican state when the people who are doing the doubting are Republican. I, I frankly, I don't get it. Because most clerks who are elected are Republicans in the state. And uh, what you just mentioned, like St. Louis County, St. Louis City, Kansas City, it's jointly run by Republicans and Democrats, yes. just for context. I believe there are 103 or 106 Republican uh, county clerks in Missouri. So really, once you're outside of the big population areas, they're all Republicans. So one of the biggest changes during the Ashcroft administration was the implementation of an early voting period where you could go in person to a designated place and cast your ballot for any reason. What do you think of that system, and would you have made any changes to it? Oh, I think it's a great idea, and I would it, implement it so it's even longer if I have the ability to do that. If the state uh, doesn't prohibit me from doing it, I think that uh, making Voting accessible to everybody who's eligible to vote is really important. This is a sacred right, and uh, it's the Secretary of State's job to make it as easy as possible while also safeguarding uh, who is voting. Currently, if you don't use the in-person absentee voting system, you need to check off an excuse about why you're voting early. But local election officials from both parties have contended the system is completely useless because there's no way to know if someone's going to be out of town on the day of the election. This has been kind of a pain in Jason's side while talking about this whole thing. You know, why keep the system in place? Oh, I don't think it's useful at all. I, I, there's no point. It, it, it really doesn't matter whether you're going to be, quote, outside the county for the day. Uh, you know, I live fairly close to the edge of my county. So I mean, what difference does it make? That might have been promulgated years ago. I, I, when a horse and buggy, I don't know. Um, I, I think just no excuse, absentee balloting, absentee balloting is a good idea. Similar vein for people who maybe 
can't vote early or can't use the absentee ballot system and want to vote but have work, you know, I know you're supposed to be able to get time off. That doesn't always happen. Um, Would you support making Election Day a state holiday? Do you think that's something that would be logistically be possible? Sure. We can do it if we want to. (laughs) It depends on whether or not we want to. I I find it interesting that in St. Louis County, um, school systems are beginning to have a day off on uh, Election Day, I think, for other reasons. But that's just sort of a natural progression of, of how voting is going. And I think a state holiday would be a really good idea. I believe that does. Senator Hoskins also agrees with that. Is that correct? So that could be another issue of agreement between you two. Well, you know what? One of the things I've discovered in the state legislature is we're Missourians. We really do have more things in common than we think we do. We even vote together in the legislature far more often than people think we do. Well, one of the issues where I think you're going to depart from Republicans is on the initiative petition process, which was a very big issue in the Republican primary. Most candidates want to make it harder to amend the state's constitution, though not all. I want to make that clear. If you're secretary of state, do you plan to advocate to make the constitution more difficult to amend, which for for context right now you need 50 percent plus one. A lot of Republicans wanted to make it 60 percent or five out of eight congressional districts are like 83 House districts out of 163. What do you think of that idea? Whatever the state of people in the state of Missouri decide, it's the job of the Secretary of State to implement that. Uh, I personally am not opposed if people decide they want to make it 53% or 55%. Uh, I may not vote that way, but that's the decision for the people of Missouri. What I adamantly oppose is this ridiculous idea of a, quote, concurrent majority, which destroys one person, one vote. And frankly, I think it's probably unconstitutional. And that, by the way, is like requiring five out of eight congressional districts. Yes. Which, by the way, I made this point under that. And this is never going to happen. But I want to just make this clear. Under that system, um, you could get 100 percent of the vote in Mo 1, Mo 2, Mo 3, Mo 4. But if one person votes in Mo 5, Mo 6, Mo 7, Mo 8, one person each and votes no on that, it would fail. So you could you could get a situation where statistically, I think 25 percent of the people could uh, negate 75 percent of the people, which is really the, the absolute, absolute opposite of democracy. And I kept stressing that, trying to stress that in the state legislature. And we actually had leg- legislators saying that rural people deserve a, a weighted vote because there are too many people in the cities. So ooh, that is really bad. <laughs> I don't know how else, how else to say it. That, that's saying you don't believe in democracy. Right now, Missourians are slated to vote for a constitutional amendment that would legalize abortion, would overturn the state's abortion ban. Um, And if Missourians do indeed vote to approve that, do you think that would dampen the enthusiasm for Republicans to pursue making it harder to amend the Constitution since passage of that would then make it harder to change it or remove any uh, amendment that would legalize abortion? I don't know. Uh, I I am going to guess that if or when it passes, Republicans will immediately try to start uh, gathering signatures to undo that amendment. And then maybe after that, they would want to have a uh, a change to the initiative petition. I think that actually if it passes, the legislature is going to probably put it something else on the ballot, weakening it, similar to what happened with Clean Missouri, which, you know, is certainly their right. But sure. I, I also think like, I can't really see this quote unquote IP reform really gaining traction again if the abortion amendment passes until it's like repealed or substantially weakened. Well, I also want to point out that behind the uh, initiative petition and and now the ranked choice voting issue that's going to be on the ballot, uh, the Republicans know that they're not very popular, so they put the ballot candy on it to begin with. And the preface is always the bait to try to 
get people to only read that and not find out exactly what's happening in the amendment. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the bait's going to be for an abortion amendment uh, that the Republicans might try to to put forward. You mentioned ranked choice voting. I want to get on that topic. And so, like you said, something that will be on the ballot this year is a measure banning ranked choice voting and would without question ban non-citizens from voting. What do you think of this proposal? Without question, non-citizens are already banned from voting. That's federal law. And it's simply an example of bait and switch because voting on that doesn't change anything. And when you lead with that and you emphasize that, uh, what the strategy is is to hide what comes after it, which is really the meat of the issue. And I am fairly agnostic on ranked choice voting. However, I'm not agnostic about the idea of foreclosing the future. And I think it's a really, really bad idea for the citizens of Missouri in 2024 to say that the citizens of Missouri of 2030 or 2050 cannot do such a thing. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And uh, so I, I'm going to vote, vote no on that uh, as a citizen. I, I'm just simply against saying the future can't figure out what they want to do for themselves. All right. I'm going to put forth the ultimate devil's advocate question on non-citizen voting, which I asked all the Republicans, and unsurprisingly, they were unsympathetic to it. But I think where this has become an issue is non-citizens voting in local elections for mayors and city councils in other states. And when this prospect is brought up as such a horrible thing, my retort is, Well, if you're talking about legal non-citizens, you're talking about people that pay taxes, that may own businesses, that may deal with local governments all the time, and they may be in the process of getting their citizenship, but it takes 10 to 15 years often. What exactly is so horrible about a non-citizen voting? Again, I'm talking about a legal non-citizen voting in a local election. Well, again, Denny Hoskins and I may have something in common. I I am not in favor of uh, non-citizens voting in any election. I was a non-citizen in another country for five years. Uh, When I was in my late 20s and early 30s, I was a a pastor in Montevideo, Uruguay, and uh, I didn't vote. I was there legally. I paid taxes, did all of that. But there really is a difference between being a citizen of one citizen, one country and a resident in another. And uh, I think that the commitment that citizens have to their own country is different from a person who is simply residing in a country. On, on that same topic, I think one of the legitimate problems that election officials and non-citizens run into is that non-citizens register to vote thinking that they have to and thinking that it is allowed. And then when they do that, their immigration status is thrown into serious jeopardy. And in mm-hmm. fact, if they vote, I think they're automatically deported from the country. That's what I was told by an immigration attorney. What would you do as Secretary of State to make people who are in Missouri legally Make them more aware that they can't do that and make sure that their immigration status is not in jeopardy. Well, that's a fairly complicated question because it really comes down to communication. And it may come down to communication in native languages as well. Uh, As I said, I had lived in South America and voting was mandatory in the country where I lived, Uruguay. So I could certainly understand how somebody who comes here and has a legal status uh, might think that they were supposed to vote. by the way, non-citizens didn't vote there. But um, I think doing a lot of PR in native languages, uh, letting folks know when they go to register to vote, there should be some information as people register to help them understand that. And maybe even look at state laws to see if there could be some sort of a grace period if somebody mistakenly does that. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating for that because I don't know if that would be a good idea, but it might be something to explore. To hop back a little bit, uh, Secretary Ashcroft kind of faced some controversy on the abortion amendment because of 
um, the ballot summer language that he submitted, which was then challenged in court and overturned. Um, so just kind of the general question about ballot summaries. Is there any way you would handle ballot summary language different from Ashcroft or any of the other people who have been Secretary of State? Well, absolutely. In fact, it was the um, what I call shenanigans that uh, Secretary Ashcroft got up to um, about the abortion ballot language that really impelled me to to run. Uh, it there is a sacred duty for the Secretary of State to make sure that people know what they're voting for, and that ballot summary is crucial to that. Most people don't read everything in a ballot amendment so or a constitutional amendment. They, that language must be neutral, it must be correct, and it must be readable. And he clearly has not done that. And in fact, again, we're seeing he's not doing that on the website and with the information that's going to be on the precincts. Uh, I don't, have you seen Yeah, the that? fair ballot summary, which I think the Secretary of State is authorized to do. Um, I will yeah. say the ACLU is considering suing over that, but I don't think they've made a decision yet. I talked to them when I right. when the ballot got certified. Right. And I think that like what we're talking about here is the literal words you read on a ballot that describes the ballot initiative. Yes, and, I understand that. However, it's the same issue. We do not have democracy if you do not know what you're voting for. And when something comes from the Secretary of State and says, this is what you're voting for, and it's incorrect, we've got a big problem. Well, thank you very much for joining us on the program. We did interview Senator Hoskins uh, earlier this year. We'll link to that uh, episode in the web post. We recommend that you listen to both and are fully informed about the candidates running for this a very important office. I, I think you're correct. This is a much more important office than people give it credit for. And I'm very glad we got many of the candidates for this office, even though it took up a lot of our time because of how many there were Republicans there were. Uh, Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. You can find all of our coverage of the 2024 election at stlpr.org. And Representative, how can people find out more about your campaign on the World Wide Web? VotePfeiffer.com. P-H-I-F-E-R. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long. Politically Speaking is produced by Sarah Kellogg, Rachel Lipman, and me, Jason Rosenbaum. The show is edited by Fred Ehrlich. Read all of our coverage at stlpr.org. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Politically Speaking by searching the term Politically Speaking on Apple Podcasts. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.